Good morning, church family. It's so good to see you. <laughs> uh, something new today. Turn to someone close to you and say, peace be with you. And then the person can reply, and also with you. <laughs> A special welcome to our guests, live streamers and Zoom callers. Thank you for joining us today. Let's start with some announcements. How many of you enjoyed Cafoye this morning? <laughs> Get it? Fellowship Cafe in the foyer, Cafoye. <laughs> we invite you to bring your travel mug next Sunday to enjoy some great lighthouse coffee um, before the service. Following the service, we will continue to have Fellowship Cafe in the lower auditorium for those that don't get up quite as early. <laughs> the Lighthouse Coffee we serve helps to support our missionaries, Dave and Louise Sinclair Peters, and their outreach efforts in Myanmar and Thailand. There is a 55 plus lunch happening this Wednesday, and the deadline to sign up is today. So please talk to Janice, Janice, wave your hand, uh, or you can register online via Connect. Speaking of Wednesday, the Korean Praise and Worship Service will be changing a little this summer and will be meeting as a small group in people's homes each Wednesday instead of meeting in the chapel. We will be continuing to have Wednesday afternoon prayer at 2.30, which everyone is invited to attend. Or if you have a prayer request, please call our prayer request line or submit online via Connect. We are on a bit of a break during the summer but we will be starting up the cooking class and grief share, pack young adults and pack youth in September. There has also been some talk about starting up the English classes in the fall as well. And we're also looking forward to a musical happening here in September. I know there's been a lot of work and practice going into it so far. Oh, and next Sunday, we are all going to Assiniboine Park following the service for our second church picnic. Jeremy checked the schedule and there are no special events booked, so we're hoping that the parking will be a little bit better. It is a nice shady spot though, and no ditches, so everyone's welcome to join us. Jim and I have been reading a book called Making Jesus Lord, The Power of Laying Down Your Rights by Lauren Cunningham. It first makes you think about what rights you think you have, either consciously or subconsciously, and then invites you to lay down your rights before Jesus. In the book, there is a poem written by Bill McChesney, who died at age 28 as a missionary in the Congo in 1964. He wrote this poem shortly before going to the Congo. As I read the poem, I invite you to ask the Holy Spirit, what area of your life are you tightly gripping that you need to trust and release to Jesus? My choice. I want my breakfast served at eight with ham and eggs upon the plate. A well-broiled steak I'll eat at one and dine again when day is done. I want an ultra-modern home and in each room a telephone, soft carpets too upon the floors and pretty drapes to grace the doors. A cozy place of lovely things like easy chairs with inner springs, and then I'll get a small TV. Of course, I'm careful what I'll see. I want my wardrobe, too, to be of neatest, finest quality, with latest style in suit and vest. Why shouldn't Christians have the best? But then the master I can hear in no uncertain voice, so clear, I bid you come and follow me, the lowly man of Galilee, Birds of the air have made their nest, and the foxes in their holes find rest. But I can offer you no bed, no place have I to lay my head. In shame I hung my head and cried. How could I spurn the crucified? Could I forget the way he went, the sleepless nights in prayer he spent? For forty days without a bite, alone he fasted day and night. Despised, rejected, on he went, and did not stop till veil was rent. A man of sorrows and of grief, 
no earthly friend to bring relief. Smitten of God, the prophet said, mocked, beaten, bruised, his blood ran red. If he be God and died for me, no sacrifice too great can be for me, a mortal man to make. I'll do it all for Jesus' sake. Yes, I will tread the path he trod. No other way will please my God. So henceforth, this my choice shall be, my choice for all eternity. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the multiple good gifts you have given to us. We know that everything comes from you and ultimately belongs to you. As Abraham was willing, up, willing to give everything up for you, even his son of promise, we too wish that we could give up all of our rights and follow you with our whole heart. Help us to trust you with our whole lives. We worship you now in gratitude. Thank you for your deep love for us, even though we do not deserve it. Amen. Now we have a Square One World News update. Ella's Backyard Blog in Ukraine. Hello, I'm Eric Borman, and this is Square One News Minute. Since 2015, our Russian children's show, Ella's Backyard, has seen great success on YouTube as we now have millions of Russian-speaking people viewing the program. But it's not just Russians that are tuning in. The number of views in Ukraine has increased dramatically. Our team is not talking about the war in the country, just relatable topics. They are, however, using the Bible to give the viewer hope and direction to Jesus. One viewer commented that since the conflict started, people are searching for hope and peace, and they're trying to find something that will distract them from what's going on around them. Thank you for what you are doing for our teenagers in Ukraine. Psalm 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. Please continue to pray for this situation in Ukraine. Visit squareoneworldmedia.com. Thanks for watching, and God bless. As we hear about the difficult situations around the world in Ukraine and here at home, it's good to be reminded that uh, as we come to the house of the Lord, we can worship God and be filled with the, the joy of the Lord. So we invite you this morning to stand, and let's just sing with the joy that we have.
Psalm 66, verses 5 to 9. Come and see what our God has done, what awesome miracles he performs for people. He made a dry path through the Red Sea, and his people went across on foot. There we rejoiced in him, for by his great power he rules forever. He watches every movement of the nations. Let no rebel rise in defiance. Let the whole world bless our God and loudly sing his praises. Our lives are in his hands, and he keeps our feet from stumbling.
Good morning. Please pray with me. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, how privileged we are that we can come freely into your presence to worship because Jesus Christ has paid the price for our sins. You have adopted us and we have a full inheritance in your kingdom. We praise you and thank you. We are grateful that we have been able to call a country like Canada our home and enjoy the freedoms and many blessings that come with living in a democracy. We have had the enjoyment of celebrating Canada Day, but along with that comes the sorrow for what has happened in our country in recent years. We ask your forgiveness that we have been mostly silent while we have seen laws passed that have greatly devalued the sacredness of life and the traditional family. Please forgive us when we forget to pray for those in authority over us. Place in us an urgency to hold before you our leaders and the things that you are sacred to you. 
We ask you to raise up many godly leaders at every level in our land. We pray that you will protect the families in our church, protect the marriages, and give great wisdom to the parents as to how to guide the minds and hearts of their children. For those of us that are in the oldest generation, help us to be faithful in prayer and in seizing opportunities to mentor and encourage the younger people. Help us to keep believing that we still have purpose and are much needed in these times. Our pastor and staff are struggling with many things, including their physical health. We ask you to heal them, renew their strength, and lift their spirits. Help us to remember to be faithful in holding them before you daily. May we never forget that they are the center of the enemy's target. Thank you that you don't get tired of us asking and that you delight in us coming to you in prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> so I'm going to use this opportunity to tell you about this wonderful little prayer card that Melanie has prepared for us. If you've ever wondered about how to pray more effectively for our pastoral team, this uh, prayer card contains many uh, scriptural prayers that will be very helpful and they, it covers every aspect of their lives. So I'm going to have some with me in Fellowship Cafe. If you're interested in having one, uh, please come and see me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Oh, wonderful. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've been ill for the last few weeks, and uh, unlike any illness I've had, actually, uh, really down and out for a few for a few weeks, and uh, so there's been lots of reflection when you're sort of uh, ill, and uh, so I also realized this is the longest stint that I've probably been away from the church, whether it be preaching for whatever reason, and so we've had a we've had a lot of delay in between, you know, myself preaching, and we've had others coming up and other services which have been just outstanding. I've been so blessed. Uh, not only with our refugee ministry uh, service, but we had uh, our intern speaking, Philip, to you all. And then uh, last week we had our young adults sharing their testimony and sharing how the Lord is working in their lives. And so it's been just such a blessing, but I've been watching most of this online and not with you. And so I realize we've had a lot of of, of time away from 2 Timothy. And this is sort of this unending uh, series because we just keep going in 2 Timothy. It just doesn't seem to end. And every time I, I'm speaking on 2 Timothy, I feel like I have to review with all of you because we've taken so much time away. So where we're at is uh, Paul is writing a letter to Timothy and what's significant for the context, and I want to say it again because it helps frame what we are doing here and why we're speaking about this letter, why we're preaching this letter. First, you're going to find that Paul is writing this letter near, if not, the, at the very end of his life. This is one of his, if not, his last letter written before his death. Now, why this is significant is because when you are facing death, which he makes very clear, he knows he's facing death in 2 Timothy, when you are facing death, you have a very different approach than you might if it was just any other day, right? There's a matter of urgency when you know your end is right in front of you and you're speaking to your spiritual son, that is Timothy. And so there is a, an intensity to this letter. And I say this to you today because it, it, it can seem rather intense 
especially my sermon series. It can seem rather heavy-handed, but I want you to know that's the intent of this letter. If you are a leader in this church, you should feel uncomfortable when I am preaching from 2 Timothy because I feel uncomfortable every time I'm preaching it. I'm going to feel very uncomfortable as I go through this, this passage with you. But that is the intent of this letter. It was written to Timothy, who was the leader, and Timothy was going to take it and disperse it to the other leaders. And so there should be a challenge to each and every leader in this church. It should make us feel a little uncomfortable. It should challenge us. What's fascinating about this letter is that we find that through the letter, as we are in chapter 4, but we've read chapters 1, 2, and 3, and we've gone extensively through those chapters, what you notice is that not only is Paul facing death, but he's also, we find that many people have left him. We find that uh, even many of those supposed leaders have led other people astray, meaning leaving the church or going on some rogue disbandant group outside of the faith community. And there's even betrayal. People have betrayed Paul. I mean, if, if there was ever a time you just want to call it quits, you would think it would be now. Everybody, it just seems like everything that possibly could be going wrong is going wrong in this small movement of Jesus followers. And yet, the Apostle Paul continues to persevere. He continues to persevere, even in the midst of the circumstances that are around him. And I think it's an important reminder to us, uh, before we even enter into these few verses we're going to spend time on, I think it's important to be reminded that the DNA of Christianity is not to give up. It is to continue to persevere in the midst of difficult circumstances because our immediate circumstances should not and cannot dictate our calling, and our mission that we are on. It's fascinating because as I look at uh, the the following few verses that we're going to spend time on, I find it harder and harder to be liked as an individual if I uphold God's word. I just, I find it really difficult in the society we live in and we continue to go towards. I find it hard to be liked as a person by upholding God's word. And I want you to know that I think anybody that is, um, any human being should want to be liked. We all like to be liked, don't we? But I find it so difficult, so difficult because the, the, the society around us often is so polarizing and divided and seems to go in such a different direction than what God's word upholds. I'm constantly tempted myself, I'm speaking to myself, I'm constantly tempted to be more liked and by doing that to soothe my own ego. And I wonder, if I'm, am I just alone in this struggle? Or do others of us struggle with that? I wish I could sometimes just be a silent bystander as a Christian. But yet that is not what God has called us to. Because the passage we're about to read, you're going to see that in the midst of suffering and persecution, Paul says, continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ. That challenges me to my core. Because I'm fine with you believing whatever you believe and I believe whatever I believe, but we just keep quiet, you know? We agree to disagree. But that's not what Paul says. He actually says go and share it with others in the midst of hostility and persecution and trials. And that challenges me to my core because I like, even outside these church walls, I don't like all that drama. I like to be liked by other people. I don't want to try, I don't want to 
uh, get into a combative argument. It wouldn't go anywhere anyways. I don't really want to, you know, share, you know, something that I know society is pulling very much against now or is going more and more in that direction. And yet, when I think of the Apostle Paul's circumstance and I think of what he's dealing with, and we talked about this a few weeks ago. We, we did. We talked about it a few weeks ago in regards to the days of judges and all that he's going into. You know, people are living their life according to what seems right in their own eyes. And I think of our society. People are living their life according to what seems right in their own eyes. And yet, when I, when I think of Paul's circumstance, I think, you know what? As hard and as difficult as it might seem here, it's far worse during Paul's time. Paul's in jail. I'm not. So why am I pouting? Pick yourself up, Jedediah. That's what I, I have to give myself a pep, pep talk. It helps me gain perspective. Because what I see Paul going through is far greater than the little challenges of someone not liking me. Paul's not dealing with people not liking that him. He's dealing with people that want to kill him. That's far greater of an issue than what I might be dealing with. And so reading 2 Timothy helps to give me perspective. Helps me to gain perspective. So let's read this passage in 2 Timothy. I've given you a little bit of context. Let's go through it now. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 to 5. It says this, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Verse 5. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news. And fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Now, there are two ways we could look at this passage. Uh, There's the half-empty approach or the half-full approach. Which approach do you want today? Do you want me to give you a half-empty approach? It'll hit hard. Or do you want a half-full approach? Okay, well, I'm just going to tell you, naturally, I'm more of a half-empty approach, especially when I'm recovering from, you know, whatever illness I had. I'm very much a half-empty right now. And that's just my natural tendency. And I like to think it's it's very appropriate because I call myself a realist. Uh, But if I'm really being upfront with you, often what that means is that I'm not leaning upon God's sovereignty and his power and his authority, and I'm only thinking through my own lens and what I can see right in front of me. But I use that excuse. But today I think we actually can turn this to a a half full approach. We already talked in the previous sermons about the society in the early church, what Paul is dealing with, what we're dealing with here in Canada. We made a a shocking correlation in regards to the days of judges. You can look at that sermon. It's May 29, 2022. It's the days of judges. You can view it on our website, pachurch.ca. We don't really need to talk more about the degradation that we're experiencing within society. And we, we know that in the midst of what we are living in, we live in a generation that is wanting to hear whatever tickles their ears. Or in other words, whatever seems right in their own eyes. In a society that continues to reject truth and searches after myths of all kinds with the various fads that come and go, what are we called to do now? Because that's, that's the real proactive approach, right? A reactive approach is to say, well... There's nothing we can do about it, and we just sort of hunker down and hold the, hold the fort together. There's another way to say, yeah, it is falling apart, but you know what? There's a way we can be proactive so that we can actually minister and reach others for Jesus Christ. That's the half full, in my opinion, and that's where we want to go. 
And, and, and Paul speaks of it. It's in verse 5. Listen to this, what he says again. But you should keep a clear mind in every circumstance, situation, excuse me. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. The emphasis here is, but you should keep a clear mind. The word that is translated in our English Bible is a Greek word. It's called napho. The word is used entirely in a very few instances in the New Testament. You see Paul using the word and Peter use it. That's it. And it's only a few instances that we have. And so I'm going to just elaborate a little bit with you. In 1 Thessalonians, we see the word again. It's translated for clear mind, just like it is in 2 Timothy. The Apostle Paul uses the letter again, additionally a little, a little bit later in Thessalonians. And he's meaning a clear mind in the context of not sleeping. That means to stay alert. The Apostle Peter uses the word. He uses it in his first letter. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says, stay alert, watch out. There it is, the word again. It's alarming, especially in the context of where it comes from. Listen to the whole verse. Stay alert, watch out. For your great enemy, the devil, he prowls like around like a roaring lion, seeking or looking for someone to devour. Be on the alert, be ready. Again, we see the word come up again in 2 Timothy of this staying awake, clear-minded, staying alert. Peter uses the word a little bit later in his first letter, and he encourages discipline or self-control, a calmness in the midst of the storm because we know you, we have readied ourselves. You're prepared. You are alert. You are ready for what might be coming your way. That's the whole breadth of this word. That's it. Okay? And so what I'm asking you today, and what we are going to spend the entire rest of this service discussing, what I'm asking you today is have you readied yourself as a Christian in the 21st century here in Canada. Maybe I'm just speaking to myself, and if that's the case, I'm sorry. But I find myself just simply wanting, at times, to bury my head in the sand and just look the other way with all the conflict that I see happening, with all of the, the problems I see in my own life, I just want to avoid dealing with the hard matters. And so what I do is I often simply distract myself in order to not deal with it. Distract myself with entertainment, social media, video games, Netflix, house projects, you name it. I do it to fill my life with more stuff in order to not deal with the matters that actually need to be dealt with. So what are the matters that I need to deal with? What are the matters that you and I need to be dealing with in our lives. First and foremost, here it is, our relationship with Jesus Christ. I can find so many excuses to put that relationship on the back burner. I can use excuses like, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. I, you know, I have four children, I'm busy. I have this emergency I have to go to. I always seem to find an excuse to throw that relationship on the back. And I want you to know that my excuses can continue on and on, and I could go through them for a long time with you. But in all reality, my relationship with Jesus is not something that I should be trying to fit in to my busy, chaotic day. But it should be that which my entire day revolves around. Let me say that again. My relationship with Jesus is not something that I should be trying to fit into my busy, chaotic day.
but it should be that which my entire day revolves around. Meaning my day should be about nurturing my relationship with the living God and then trying to fit everything else into my day. And I know that there's some of us here that are more of the half-empty types, the negative types. I get you. I'm with you on that. And you might say, well, let's be realistic. We got bills to pay and responsibilities here in our day. But what if you were to leave your job because it was not conducive for your relationship with Jesus Christ? Maybe it would be if it was hindering you in some way. Maybe the work environment was negative. Maybe it, was, it demanded too much of your time. Maybe it drained you of your opportunity to really invest in your relationship with God. What if you put that relationship at the forefront, even if it meant sacrificing financially? What if your relationship was so important that it even had a greater importance than even your family time? You know, I think back long ago when I was a kid, <clears throat> a young child, and, and maybe you experienced this if you grew up in the church, and, and maybe you didn't. I don't know how many of you grew up in the church and how many did not. Some of you are from here, some of you are not. I'm from California, so I don't even know if you experienced this here in Canada. But let me just give you a little bit of my own childhood. I remember several services that we used to have a week as a kid. Can any of our veterans here attest to that? Was that, did you guys have that here? Like you had several services? It wasn't just like one service you showed up to? Yes? Okay, I see George Tykreeb. I see Janice. People are like nodding. Adina, thank you. Okay, so I've got, I've got a yes to that. I mean, and, and it was fascinating because when a, when a pastor used to call uh, for a prayer visual, it wasn't like just a couple people came, at least my experience. It's like the whole church showed up for the prayer. You didn't have to beg or plead or advertise over the bulletin, internet, or on the overhead. The pastor said, we're going to have some prayer, and God's people gathered. I remember my father just being, you know, working such a hard day, exhausted, get, getting us all in the car, immediately after work and driving midweek to go to a prayer vigil or to a service. Because that's what we did. That was primary, not secondary. A, a pastor, and I'll say it again, would say, we're having a prayer. God's people just gather. And I want you to know that we're often reaping the success of many people that came before us who were persistent in their faith. But I want you to know today, we have a prayer team, including our staff, of about five, sometimes up to seven or eight people who regularly pray together. What I'm getting at is I just don't see the hunger like I did those years long ago. And maybe I'm missing something. You might say, no, you just don't get it. Society's changed. But has prayer changed? I think we owe a lot to those parents and grandparents that sacrificed so much and put their faith as a priority in their lives. And so what I'm getting at today is maybe we need to reprioritize what is important in our life. I can tell you right now, family activities, number one importance. And we've had to work through that in our own family. I got any hockey families here? Boy, I remember the hockey season in southern Manitoba. Guaranteed I wasn't going to see young families come hockey. What is it that's so important in our lives? Uh, one of my favorite wrestlers, don't worry if you don't know this name, is Dusty Rhodes, and he once said, we are coming on some hard times. And I loved his speeches as a little kid watching this wrestler speak. And I believe we need to be alert, prepared, ready, and calm under the strain of this world that seems at times to be fighting against us. 
And we need to be ready to handle the hard times because they're coming. So my question to you and for me is what are we doing to prepare ourselves? And this is the application. What is helping us to nurture our relationship with Jesus Christ so that we can handle the hard times that are coming? First and foremost, I think we need to have, and I've already talked about it, but this is my first point, we need to have a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift. I had a professor, a freshman in college, use that phrase for literally an entire year. For at least the first semester, I didn't even know what he meant. So why am I using it today? I have no idea. I just thought it would be so fancy for y'all. It's such a convoluted term. But all I'm saying is we need to think differently. Pattern our thinking differently. For example, and I'm going to be very personal about this, okay? You can all check me about this. You can talk to Deanna about this. I'm, I'm a father of four children. And I want you to know that we have many activities. And, it, and when it comes to the end of the night, after I'm exhausted, I've had work, we've had all these activities go on, the last thing I want to do is read the Bible and pray with my kids. I want some downtime. I want some silence. I've only had noise my entire day. And I know I'm an extrovert, but I sometimes just need some alone time. Do you all get me? A little bit. And so what I end up doing is I cram in God's word quickly. As quick as I can. Let me tell you, I've got a system down. It's amazing how quickly I do it. Prayers, boom, boom, boom. Out, bed, bye. Okay? But the question that I'm asking is what am I teaching my children? By throwing in, you know, that... God component at the very end of my night when I'm exhausted and I'm just trying to get it over with? What do you think I'm communicating to each one of my children? Do you think they start to notice that maybe God's not really that central? It's something I can just sort of put in at the last minute, try to fit it in if I have time, if I feel like it. Deanna and I realize that we have to make and have to be more intentional in our efforts, especially when it comes to these important spiritual matters, to show our kids that our relationship is more important than anything else in our life. And thus, this summer, we are starting and committing to making more time available for faith discussions. Instead of saving it for the end of the day, we're doing it earlier in the day. And guess what? I still don't like it because it messes up my busyness of my schedule. But I need to show my children that there is something that is more important than their activities, than their school, than anything else. This is of the utmost importance. Whether your life is good or bad, if you know Jesus Christ, hallelujah. Now, I can't tell you what you should be doing to reprioritize and, and change the way you View your relationship with Jesus Christ. For me, it's been very vital that I have to be intentional with my children. I have to show them. I can't just just think that they're going to pick it up somehow. They don't even see me half the time praying or, or, or in God's word. Why? Because I do that late at night where everybody's in bed because I'm the night owl, now, night owl in my family. But I have to be more intentional. Now, for you, I don't know what that might be. I don't know your context. I don't know your family life. But I, but I think we need to come to this reality that our relationship with God is the purpose of our day. And when we come to that reality, you will only discover peace, joy, contentment by knowing the living God. And so you need to determine what that might look like in your life. You know, our veterans, you know, you don't have, most of you hopefully don't have children at your house. So the component's going to look a lot different of how you're going to reorganize, prioritize that relationship. Think of it differently. And that will help us to have not only a clear mind, but as that word expands and is used in the New Testament, we will be 
readied for the hard times. We will have a calmness in the midst of the storm. Now, secondly, and I, I want to talk to you about the second one, and this one is really important, but often gets completely and utterly misguided by other people. Because what we do really good as, as a people group is we love to apply our issues and our temperament on other people. And that is the wrong approach when you are talking about spiritual discipline. And I'm going to talk to you about it because I have gone wrong on this so many times personally by mentors, actually, people that I respect and I love, but their temperament was very different than mine. What spiritual disciplines have you embraced in your life that helps you to be clear-minded, alert, and ready? What practices could you be doing in your life that could nurture and grow your relationship with Jesus? What practices do you have to prepare you for the hard times? Now, some of you might say, well, I fast. Wonderful. Maybe it's purposely dedicating your time in your day where you can just be alone with the Lord and listen to his voice and read his word and just simply bask in his presence. Maybe it's memorizing scripture. I've always been bad at memorizing scripture. I'm terrible at it, but I do it. Why? Because I have seen and been at people's bedside that were near the end of their life where they were in a situation where they were very vulnerable. And those that had scripture memorized, I cannot tell you how many times they would speak God's word and it would bring a peace that passes all understanding, even in the midst of death. And I witnessed it time and time again from many of you veterans here and the ones that have gone. And I, it has driven me to say, even though I'm terrible at it, I need to have that spiritual discipline. Because boy, is that going to be important. And I've noticed even when I memorize scripture and I'm having a hard day and I'm on the run, I can recite. And it comforts. And it speaks to me. Let me give you a personal example of a spiritual discipline. Because really, memorizing scripture is uh, pretty tough for me. <clears throat> That's not one, one that comes natural. I want you to know that recently, you know I've been struggling with my health. And uh, that also has brought about a little bit of a struggle with my spiritual health. Because there is something that I do quite intentionally that I'm not able to do when I'm ill. Uh, five days a week, I go into the gym I work out, I put my headphones on, I have a hoodie, sweater, I don't talk to anybody, I'm in a zone. Hoodie, sweater, pulled down, okay? Over my head, and you know what I listen to? I listen to the Bible. For five hours a week, I hear the Bible, and it ministers to me. It gets me thinking about what I might be sharing with you all. The Lord speaks in that time. I'm just focused on working out and hearing God's voice and listening to God's word. It's so important for me because I'm a personality that needs goals. So for me to go to the gym and I have goals set, it drives me. And it also gives, creates an environment for me to listen. You don't want to put my temperament in a monastery. That would be torture. And I know there's some of you that are far more reflective. Hallelujah. And we need that diversity in the kingdom. But you don't want to put me in a monastery. That would be suffering. I've tried it. I've done it. I still try it because people are like, you need to just find a, a space and just rest in his presence. No, I need goals. That's what gets me fired up. You know, some of you love to be in God's creation. I think of many of you that love to do camping and love to go hiking. You know what hiking I like is challenges. When I have to deal with, you know, a big challenge, there's a big hill in front of me. When there's stairs I got to climb, when there's a challenge in front of me and I go, can I physically do that? My wife, when we, you know, when we go to Yosemite, she'll tell me all the time, would you just sit still and look at this beautiful scenery? I could care less about the scenery. Yeah, it's pretty. It's another tree. That's where I want to go. 
That's, my te- that's the way the Lord's wired me, and I don't have to apologize for it. And for years, I didn't know who I was, and I used to apologize all the time and beat myself up because I didn't have this reflective personality or this appreciation for whatever it is. But God has wired me in a particular fashion. That's why when I go to the gym, that's my sanctuary. Because I have goals, I have an agenda, I know what I'm going to do, I'm trying to build greater muscle, and at the same time, I know the Lord's going to minister in that environment because that's the way I'm wired. And I don't know how you're wired, so I'm not going to tell you, you need to do this, and you need to do that. But my goodness, you got to find your spiritual discipline that ministers to you where God is speaking. you got to figure out who you are, spend time with him. Because he knows you better than you know yourself. You know how you're wired. Find spiritual disciplines that are conducive for your personality. If you're someone that's very outdoorsy, I think of Scott. Scott Coop, he's not here today. But Scott, it was like, when he needed to just get an awakening in his life, he went out to the woods. He went out into the bush. That's what ministered to him. For me, if it was to minister to me, you'd have to drop me in the middle of the bush and say, try to survive. Then I'd go, oh, this is interesting now. There's a challenge here. That's the only thing that would interest me. But there's, it's great if you love that, if that's what ministered to you. I think of Emily Reeve. I know she's not here. My goodness, it's the long weekend. But Emily Reeve, we talk, she's in our... Uh, our youth leadership, and, and we often will do, when she plans the uh, activity, it's often more reflective because she loves that reflective way of growing and learning. And that's wonderful. And if the Lord's wired you that way, hallelujah, I've got some great monasteries you can go to. I've tried a lot of them. Disaster for Pastor Jedediah, great for your personality. And they're really affordable. But find how you are wired. Don't let others tell you what you should do because of their experience. I'm not John Wheeler. John Wheeler is not Jedediah. We love each other. We're brothers in the Lord, but we're very different. So be aware of that. Lastly, and this is the last point today, you want to be prepared, you want to be ready for the hard times that are coming, you need to be in a faith community. Could you please put that up? Thank you. It's not an option. It's not, it's not well, you know, that's nice. It's nice to have some people and be, no, you need to be in a faith community. If the last two years have taught us anything, have taught us anything, when you isolate people, what you get is a whole bunch of craziness. You need to be in community. And I know we have our Sunday morning service. It's wonderful. But there are ways that you can be actively involved in this this church in a more intentional and intimate way. There are ministries all over this church that are going on. Many of them you know, some of them you don't know. Let me just give you a few off the top of my head. This is really dangerous. This is not in my script. And why this is dangerous is I might forget a ministry. And I wanted you to know I apologize. I didn't look at our calendar. Melanie, I'm sorry. I didn't look at the calendar of lists or, the, or our, our spreadsheet of all our ministries. But let me just give you a few. If you are wired as you are a social justice warrior and you're wired in that way and you're saying, I want to help the down and out, guess what? We have a ministry for that right here. According to your temperament, we have a ministry and they meet semi-regularly and they help out the, the down and out. They help out the refugee, those that are in terrible circumstances and help to get them to places where they are no longer persecuted and where they can thrive, and where they can grow in their faith in Jesus Christ without the hostility of the circumstances around them. You want to get involved? If you're online here today, you want to get involved? If you're here today in the sanctuary, you want to get involved? All you need to do is talk to Norman. Norman, would you please stand up? Norman Cameron is right here. Norman Cameron is a Scottish man, so it's wonderful if you go and talk to him because he's got a beautiful Scottish accent. 
He's also very gentle, unlike me. So he won't bite. He's very kind and very loving. Please go and find Norman. If you say, I am interested, Norman's your man. Thank you, Norman. But it doesn't stop there. If you're, if you're someone that says, but I, I, I'm not there right now in my life. I, I, I'm just, I'm needing support, a woman's group. Well, guess what? We got that here. Let me tell you about Need and Knit. It is a pro, it is a ministry for women. And you don't have to knit, bake or knit. It's about women getting together and ministering and coming together. And they come together every so often. And if you want to know more about Need and Knit, here you go. Marilyn, could you please stand? And there, Marilyn Cameron, who's married to Norman Cameron, leads it. All you have to do, and actually, Adina, could you stand as well? Adina is going to stand as well. I'm sorry, Adina. I'm, this is on the fly. All you need to do, go and talk to them. Women, they're there. They're ready. Thank you. If you've, made, if you've encountered a great amount of loss, we have grief share. The, it's, it's a full class. We already have a sign-up. We're already halfway signed up at this point for the class that's starting in September. If you're saying, yes, I'm processing through a lot of grief and loss, we have something, a, a small group for you. It's led by Pastor Jennifer, who is in the back, in the translation room, so I can't have her do much other than she's smiling, which is great. But it doesn't stop there. If you're somebody that says, well, I'm a, I, I'm, I'm a veteran, I've been around for a few years, 55 and above, well, hallelujah, we have a ministry here for you particular to maybe what maybe you're saying I want to meet others that are my age I'm new in the church or I'm viewing this online and I want to know more of how I can get involved Janice Penner could you please stand up thank you I know we talked about it already Janice Penner's right here all you have to do if you're 55 and above and you're interested in this in a, in a ministry to be involved with with other veterans in the church seniors in the church please go and talk to Janice if you're saying to yourself, I'm a, I'm a guy and I, I, I'm looking for some support. Well, we have a men's breakfast that happens every month. Now, I don't know who I'm going to ask uh, because I don't even see him in. Um, I guess it's me. Come and talk to me. I was going to have Rick Penner stand up, but Rick's outside because he's helping doing something. Um, but I'm right here. You can come and talk to me. I'm there most, most uh, months. I'm there. It's a wonderful time. It's 8 to 12 of us that meet for breakfast. We minister, we pray, we, we share life together. You want to be part of it? Come. Come and talk to me. But it doesn't stop there. We have our kids in the Word that we're hoping to be starting back up in September. Deanna's nowhere to be found. I don't know where she is with my kids. But you can come and talk to me if you have small children. Youth, come and talk to me. I'm here. We've been doing youth. Most of the youth are not even from our church at this point. Young adults, go and talk to Pastor Jennifer. She's still in the back translating. The list could go on and on and on. This summer, we have, we have a, a picnic. You want to get to know the church family? Go and show up. We have games nights. We have lots of ways for you to plug in to the church. And so we want to encourage you. If you want training and growth in your faith, we have this workshop. We have 43 people that are registered for this workshop. Most of them are from our church. You want to grow in your faith? You're saying, yeah, I want to learn how to better listen to God. I, I'm taking the class myself. I want to grow in that area. I hope we all do. It's wonderful. Well, we have a, a workshop for you. And we're going to have more and more workshops available. What I'm trying to get at is that we need relationships. We need to be in relationship with others because it helps us to gain perspective. And as we invest in people's lives, it strengthens us because we support each other as we walk this faith journey together. Ultimately, we love each other as Christ has loved us, and thus we grow in our relationship with him. It's so important that we are in a faith community. And I'm giving you all these examples of all these ministries, and I know I've missed a few, for an intentional reason. 
I want, I want to say this to you. There's no excuse for not getting involved. You want to grow in your faith? We have given you every opportunity. We brought you to the water. I can't make you drink it. Here it is. Get involved. We need to be in community. If we want to prepare for the hard times that are coming in our life, we need to change the way we're thinking. We need to see our relationship as primary. It needs to be what our entire day is about. Everything else we work into our day. Secondly, we need to have those spiritual disciplines. It took me years to understand that I'm wired differently than many of my mentors and realize that this is how I can grow in my faith and it's a discipline that I do that helps me to grow. So I'm not gonna tell you which spiritual discipline you need to, in, need to do. But try them all. I have. Thirdly, we need to be connected to a faith community where we are growing together so that we can encourage each other, minister to each other, and grow as God has called us to, to be part of his bride, that is the church. If we want to prepare for the hard times that are coming, we need to get ready and be prepared. Amen. An important growth in our relationship with Jesus Christ is this idea of submitting our lives to him, living in obedience to him, allowing him to have lordship in our life. And Jesus has asked us to remember his sacrifice by physically doing a particular ceremony. And I want us to do that today. And if you do not have an element here, could you please raise your hand? Rick is here to bring it by. We've got a few up here, Rick, too, and one in the back. Thank you. We, yeah. I'm just going to wait a minute or two here. And Rick, there's one more in the far back, all the way back there. Yep, thank you. Now, for someone like me, I go, why do I participate in this? Well, there's two reasons. One, he asks us, and if he's Lord of our lives, if Jesus is Lord of our lives, we obey. But the second reason is this. We as human beings are forgetful. I, I, can't rem I can remember time and time again, uh, as I look back, even when I was ill the last two weeks, especially a few days where I was really ill, I remember thinking to myself how quickly I forget God's goodness in my life. I have a couple bad days, and all of a sudden, you know, my mind goes in weird places. And I have to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, look at all these years, 42 years of God's faithfulness, and I'm losing sight of it with a couple bad days. That's why we do this, to not lose sight of God's goodness and his sacrifice that redeemed us and gave us life in this world and the world to come. And so I want us to, if you can just, there's a cellophane on top, if you can just take that off, you'll see the, the wafer here. I'm going to read you Jesus' words here in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, starting in verse 26. It says this, as they were eating... Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. This is the body that was beaten and tortured so that you could have life. Let us take of this wafer. Verse 27, And he took a cup of wine, and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them, each, and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again till the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is the blood 
that was sacrificed and poured out on behalf of you. Let's take of it. I'd like to say a prayer. Could you please bow your heads with me as we pray? Lord Jesus, may we not forget your great sacrifice. May we not allow our immediate circumstances to dictate your goodness and your eternal plan for our lives. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would continue to go with us today. Remind us of how much you love us and bring us back together again. Lord, help us to be a community that loves each other, that serves each other, and ultimately serves your kingdom here in Winnipeg. We love you and we praise you. In Christ Jesus' name, the name above every name, amen. I have a few more words to share with you today. If you are someone that's here today or on this live stream, I just want to, I, I always feel compelled, even if it's uncomfortable, I feel so compelled that every time I'm speaking, I have to offer Jesus. I have to. It's my mandate. If, if, if I wasn't a pastor, maybe I wouldn't feel I'd have to, but I have to if I'm up here. And I want you to know that when, I, when Jesus got a hold of my life, and when I said yes to Jesus, it was the most important decision I ever made in my entire life. And if you are someone today that just simply says, I, I, want, I want to know more about the God that you've been talking about, Jesus Christ, this relationship with Jesus, then I, I would ask of you, please come and find me after the service. I would love to just pray with you, share my story with you. And if you're on the live stream right now, uh, please my number, my email, my information's all there. You can contact me. I'll come drop everything just to have a conversation with you about Jesus. It would be an honor and a privilege to do so. Now in closing, I, I have this benediction. I was going to memorize it, but I wasn't feeling good. So I didn't memorize it. I told you I'm a bad memorizer. But could we stand for the benediction, please? <coughs> in Hebrews chapter 13, Verse 20 to 21, it says, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. And can God's people please say? Amen. Amen. Lord willing, I hope to see you next week here at 1420 Portage Avenue. Blessings and bye for now.